Okay, so uh, thanks. This is the second to last session. Uh, I'm Mike Manville. I'm an associate professor of urban planning here at UCLA, and I'll be the moderator. And this session is called Disruptive Disrupting Disruptive Mobility. Uh, and it's about uh, Uber and such. So let me just explain very quickly what this, what we're gonna talk about, and then I'm gonna turn this over to uh, my panelists who are each going to introduce themselves and say a bit about uh, what they think the big issues are, and then we're just gonna go straight into a kind of panel discussion, um, and then we will open it up to the crowd. So the, what this is about is basically we are now, uh, depending on where you pin the start date, about 10 years into the so-called rideshare or ride hail revolution. It was about 2012, 2013 when Uber and Lyft started to make themselves really known in a lot of metropolitan areas and started to kind of take transportation by storm. Uh, and in that intervening decade since then, uh, a lot has happened. Right, so uh, the transportation network companies and especially Uber, like sort of rode to huge heights. Uber had this huge valuation. Uh, people started talking about the company uh, as though it was either the solution to all our transportation problems or uh, the harbinger of a new era of darkness in transportation and labor relations. Um, it has been, Uber has been credited with solving a long-standing problem in uh, linking people with rides through its creative use to peer-to-peer. -peer. It's been blamed for traffic congestion. It's been blamed for uh, exploiting its workers. Uh, it has been valued at over $10 billion, and it has had a uh, very disappointing IPO during that time. Um, so what we're going to do, and that's just Uber, right? And during that time also, we've had all these sort of smaller, more niche spin-off companies start. We've had promising uh, and, and not so promising experiments with getting rideshare companies to help us link up with transit and on and on and on. And so the purpose of this uh, discussion is just to kind of take stock of where we've been and think about after COVID uh, where these types of transportation services are going. As I'm sure all of you noticed during the pandemic, um, what was once kind of an abundant service, right? It seemed for a while there that you could always summon a rideshare car uh, at a very cheap price, uh, became a very scarce and expensive service. And now that seems to be sort of coming back to normal. Um, but the question is, are we gonna get back to where we were? Uh, or is, you know, is, is the, the, that previous early age of ride sharing over for good? Um, and I do not have the answers for this stuff. That's why we have these three. Uh, so what I'm going to do right now is uh, ask each of them in turn to introduce themselves and say a few words about uh, where they see the broad picture being, and then we'll get into the discussion. And so I'll start with Anne. Great. Well, hi, everyone. It's good to be with you for the almost uh, final session. Um, so I'm Ann Brown. I'm an assistant professor at the University of Oregon. Um, and I think some of my biggest questions around ride hailing are, and have always been since it first entered the scene a decade ago, um, are really how can it and can it fill the gaps in our existing transportation system? So I think today we've been hearing a lot about um, the service gaps in transit, for example. And so for ride hail, there's really two gaps that I see could fill is the temporal gaps, so time of day, um, and then spatial gaps. So of course, transit can't be everywhere and at every time. So can ride hailing fill those gaps? Um, at the same time, I see there's a potential like Mike alluded to, there's this um, positive vision for the future. At the same time, the people who might most benefit from these services are at the most risk of being left behind. So we think about um, technology barriers. We think about parents who want to tra uh, travel with their children, but how do you handle a car seat? Um, you think about how the companies themselves, the ride hail companies, argue that they are uh, technology companies and therefore not subject to ADA requirements, right? So there's a lot of uh, remaining barriers and challenges um, in order to ensure that these services are filling gaps, um, as I think they have for some, but how do we ensure that they are um, bridging the gap for those who need it the most? Uh, my name is Alyssa Harley. I'm Director of Transit Development at Circuit. We are an all-electric microtransit service that focuses on the first and last mile. So we fill a gap in between where a scooter or, or um, 
active transportation might be comfortable to use or accessible to use between uh, buses that are good for longer distance routes and Uber and Lyft drivers that on an independent contractor model don't like short distance routes. Um, I have a background in international relations and looking at technology commercialization and how uh, innovative technologies can be adapted to and consider the human factor. Um, and I was also previously a policy fellow at the Los Angeles Clean Tech Incubator um, and had uh, the, the great privilege of studying here at UCLA in my undergrad. Um, the big uh, questions that I look at in this space is electrification. Um, just to give you a bit of background, Circuit started in 2011 as an all electric service. We've been electric for 10 years, and I know that many companies have plans to be electric in 10 years. How can we take this existing expertise in electrification, and how can we also look at it in dif different form factors, not just very large buses, uh, but also smaller vehicles, how to, how to integrate that into a complementary system that provides multiple choices in uh, across geographies that are not just available in urban and dense zones. And also, how can we center equity in this, uh, as well as um, provide green jobs, not just replacing jobs either with automation or with an independent contractor model? Cool. Uh, thanks, Mike. Thanks for having me here. My name is Harry Campbell, and I'm the founder of The Rideshare Guy. It's a blog for Uber and Lyft drivers. I started it about eight years ago. Actually, um, I used to uh, be an engineer in my uh, previous career and started driving for Uber and Lyft on the side and really just started documenting my experience and over the years have tried a number of different services and kind of built out the media side of the business and cover not only Uber and Lyft, but uh, really anything that moves extensively. And I know someone was speaking on the past panel um, about you know that bus operator experience. And that's sort of actually like what my goal is in doing stuff like this. It's to kind of bring that perspective from the front lines, obviously labor shortage and really kind of understanding that driver's perspective and sometimes how these companies work from the inside I think is interesting. I mean, I think like with a lot of complicated subjects, I think Mike pointed to this that you know, people either, either love Uber or hate Uber, and I'm probably somewhere in the middle <laughs> because I don't work for Uber, but I'm also not on the other side. And I think that, you know, that driver perspective is really interesting and that worker perspective, and especially in industries like this, because you can just see so much about how the company works, right? We were just talking about how bus operators, I think, were starting at $19 an hour. Uber just pushed a notification to my Uber driver app last week that drivers in LA uh, were averaging $29 an hour, um, you know, driving for Uber and they're responsible for their own expenses, but that's during all of their online time. So period one, period two, and period three. And, uh, you know, so I think just even simple stuff like that, which kind of lines up, you know, we've got contributors in LA earning 40 to $50 an hour, and they're, you know, hopefully the top drivers because they write for me and uh, have done all our courses and training and things like that. But I'm really excited to be here today to kind of provide that experience that comes from, you know, not only working on the front lines, but sort of seeing the industry from that perspective. And, you know, you know, really kind of finding a lot of common ground. I think that, you know, I'm definitely no expert in uh, transportation or, you know, when it comes to buses or things like that, but a lot of the principles we are finding are very similar. You know, what drivers care about across any different service, whether you're driving a bus or an Uber or a truck, it's pretty simple. It's money, earning as much as possible, as fast as possible. <laughs> and, uh, you know, I think even that concept, not a lot of people may realize that on Uber, uh, you can actually literally go out in a best case scenario, be approved in less than a day. You can go give a ride, cash that money out to your bank account instantly. They've got a service called FastPay, which is probably the most popular uh, product ever released on the driver's side that you can literally get instantly paid. And so if you're looking at it at the competition of landscape of jobs, right, and you've got some schedule flexibility and you've got some, uh, you know, cool features like that, you start to see why it is uh, attractive. But at the same time, there's plenty of negatives too, which I'm sure we'll get into and I'm happy to discuss the uh, pro uh, pros and cons. <laughs> Okay, that's great. So, um, so as you can see, we have a wide range of perspectives on ride sharing here and a wide range of, of sort of background expertise. So I'm going to kind of just jump around a little bit and throw questions that may uh, be more suited to, to one or, or two of you than the others, but everyone should feel comfortable jumping in. But I want to start um, keying off a little bit on uh, some things that Alyssa mentioned in her remarks. Uh, which is the, you know, kind of the two big things about Circuit. One, it's electric, and two is that it was really started 
uh, to, to sort of be a complement between ride sharing and public transportation, right? One of the big controversies that has sort of followed ride sharing since it began was, is this going to help transit or is it going to swallow it? Um, and so the, the first question I'll throw out, and then, and then we'll follow up with a second one. First question is, where, where is rideshare really going to be uh, situated with respect to this transition toward electric vehicles, right? So and to, to just uh, preface this a little bit more, at the sort of a few years into the Uber and Lyft revolutions, the, the two big companies were just like, we're the tip of the spear, right, with all the technology. And I still clearly remember reading a, a, a promotional thing from Lyft that said it was something like by 2025, 95% of our miles driven are going to be autonomous and electric. Um, they may not hit that goal. Uh, <laughs> but at the same time, right, there is real promise that these could play an important role in electric, in the transition to electric, and also in matching up with, with transit. And so I'd love to first hear from Melissa about this and then to the others as well. Yeah, I think uh, some of it is in the title of this panel that it's disruptive mobility. Uh, circuit from the start has focused on the complementary. You don't have to disrupt transit to improve transit. Uh, and you don't have to disrupt cities to improve cities. Um, as far as electric, I, I think from the start, our founders saw that electric was both more affordable to operate, lower maintenance costs, and lower operations costs. Um, and when you look at the fluctuating price of gas as well, it was attractive to have something that was more stable. So we started electric for very economic reasons, but the uh, social and environmental benefit was, was there already too. Um, we partner with cities on many of our programs. So we started in 2011, it was mainly advertiser supported models. And starting in 2016, we saw more cities be interested in on-demand models of transportation. And we uh, applied for a city of San Diego program that uh, rather than using a fixed route trolley system for their downtown, they decided to look at an on-demand model. And they started using, um, uh, they started this RFP process, which we were selected for. Uh, since starting, we have helped the city of San Diego save uh, around 700 metric tons of CO2. That is driven somewhat from a, a fareless model where we don't charge a fare to, uh, to use the service. We have uh, advertising that is an additional revenue stream, but it's not reliant on the advertising. And the city itself isn't using specifically, you know, federal transportation funds, but something that is uh, more tied to the service, which is a uh, parking fees. So if you're trying to make it easier to park anywhere in San Diego and to spread parking out around the city, not just at the waterfront, but in other uh, areas where the city has parking facilities, a parking shuttle uh, matches closely with uh, you know, that revenue model. So we look at uh, places where it's going to be easier to deploy a lot of small vehicles than one large vehicle. And when you're thinking about electrification, that is part of it too. It's less grid impact, but it's also more resilient. You have, if one vehicle fails, that's not the entire service. So it's easier to manage on a maintenance level and it makes it easier and quicker to deploy because you have a lot of different types of manufacturers that you can look at for either electric sedans, electric vans, or electric neighborhood vehicles. So um, NEVs is what they're typically called, neighborhood electric vehicles. Uh, rather than uh, being limited to, to those manufacturing buses. Um, in terms of autonomous, um, Circuit has always looked at autonomous as something that could be coming, but it's not autonomous in terms of always replacing the driver. Autonomous and the technology that comes with it could assist the driver to make it a better experience for the driver in that job. It's not always you know, a replacement that, that you have to look at it as. And I think that's also what we should look at rideshare and all these different transportation modes. The more choice that we offer, as, as panelists before has said, the less likely someone's going to choose a single occupancy vehicle as the first choice. 
Yeah, I, I would definitely add on. I'm extremely bullish on the sort of future and intersection of electrification and ride hail. I mean, most people may not realize that, if, you know, believe it or not, an Uber driver puts a lot of vehicles on their car. A full time driver will easily do over a thousand miles per week, um, you know, driving 40 hours a week. And so a lot of the benefits of electrification, you know, Alyssa mentioned the lower maintenance costs, of course, especially right now with gas prices surging. And, you know, there have been a number of stories uh, with drivers obviously complaining about the high cost of gas since they're responsible for their expenses. Expenses. Electrification is a huge uh, boon there. And so I think that there's definitely, we're already seeing this natural appetite from drivers to learn more. But the problem is that if you've got an existing vehicle, converting or upgrading or switching to an EV is extremely expensive, right? I mean, all of the EVs out there are not cheap. And so that upfront cost, even though there is a relatively short break even period, a lot of drivers who are not earning a ton of money don't have the uh, capability to do that. So we are seeing a lot of interest from fleets. You know, um, I know I know Uber and Lyft have talked a lot about electrification. They haven't really done much, but a lot of the fleets that are out there renting vehicles that Uber and Lyft drivers are doing a lot because I think they're able to bear that upfront cost and really kind of arbitrage the you know whether it's a six or a twelve month break even period for someone who's doing one thousand or honestly sometimes more, maybe fifteen hundred miles a week. You know, that's four to five times more than the average driver. So you can really start to uh, you know get reap a lot of the benefits there. So there are a number of companies. I got a PR pitch in my inbox uh, this morning from um, Sunil Paul, who was the original founder of Sidecar. His team just launched a company called Spring EV that's doing a financing agreement for new EVs to then rent to Uber and Lyft drivers. A company here in LA called Hive um, that was part of the original uh, FAIR team raised $30 million to rent vehicles to <laughs> EVs to Uber and Lyft drivers. So there's definitely a lot of interest there. I think it's just important to understand kind of who has the financial incentives to do so and make that transition happen a little quicker and also kind of who has the capability, right? I'm sure a lot of drivers would love to go EV, but as an individual, it's tough. Right. Okay. And now I'm going to throw this uh, the, on the transit side. I'm just going to throw it over to Anne. So, and then, and then open it up to the others too. So the, the one thing we just talked about that, of course, Circuit focuses on is having that electric electrification. And the second part is that link up. Um, so what is the what are the the opportunities and obstacles to to really having a, a situation where rideshare helps transit out? And, and usually when we talk about this, we talk about closing this first le first last mile gap. But uh, you know how realistic is it? I think it's one hundred percent possible. So as Mike knows well, um, he and I have uh, been undertaking a multi year study to evaluate LA Metro's. Uh, via programs. This was a first mile, last mile to select stations around the region. Um, and the question was partly, can this work? Will people take on-demand um, microtransit, so pooled vehicles, to transit stations? And the answer is undeniably yes. So over the course of a number of years, um, people took hundreds of thousands of rides. Um, so people got from their destination to transit stations and vice versa. On the other hand, the question is, well, who is taking these trips, right? This is an expensive service. Um, who are you getting to transit? And the service ran from 6 a.m. to midnight. Um, and so when you think about, again, filling spatial and temporal gaps, one thing it missed was the latest of the late nights, right? When transit service is the, um, the when there's the least transit service, right? Or maybe you took a took a bus at peak hour and it came every 10 minutes, but by the time you're, you're going home, there is no transit service. So in this case, this service wouldn't help those people. And when we surveyed people about who is using these services, what we found is they were compared to Metro's normal riders or riders at these stations, they were disproportionately younger, higher income, and a higher share were white. When you then look at how did they previously get to transit stations, what we found was they were primarily or disproportionately taking um, ride hail, paying for it themselves rather than receiving these free rides. So Metro paid fully for these rides um, or they were being dropped off. Now, undeniably, this was a win for people taking the service, right? They weren't paying for their own trips. Um, their spouse, roommate, partner um, what, weren't having to spend their time to drop people off. But again, it's a question of were people, were more people able to access transit? Maybe. Um, we don't know exactly who was taking service before and after. We didn't see big ridership bumps at the specific stations, and most people we surveyed um, had previously used the stations. Now, a caveat to this also might be that you think about how do people find out that this is a possible service? Um, Metro wasn't responsible for the uh, advertising of these services. Via was, which is a company that they 
contracted to run them, and primarily the advertising happened at stations. Right, so if you're wanting to attract new state new riders, the place not to advertise is probably stations, right? Um, so there's some logistical challenges. These are complicated, um, you know, real life challenges. Um, and I think when we think about the this competition versus complementation, complement complementary nature that Ride Hill can take, I think the answer is likely both. Um, when we, I think often we also fear the um, ride hailing pulling transit riders away, and that certainly happens too. But one question we don't also ask in that case is, well, what was the quality of that transit trip? Right? When I've surveyed or interviewed people, they say, well, I didn't want to wait two hours, or not two hours, 30 minutes for transit at, at, late at night because I didn't feel safe. Right? In that case, taking a ride hail is a net boon right, if you're increasing safety, even if it's higher cost. Um, and so I think it's just a messy picture in terms of the, the complementary versus competition nature. It's, you could look at single trips, but you also could look at short and long periods of time. Um, I don't think there's a black and white answer to that. Um, it can provide first and last mile um, services, but again, I don't think it's the silver bullet. All right, great. I, I mean, and I'd love to open this up because I think you can both also chime in for sure. So whoever wants to go first. Yeah, I could say that when the programs are designed to complement transit and not designed to can cannibalize it, then it works very well. Um, for uh, the usage that we've seen with Circuit, um, since the pandemic started, we've seen a great increase of users that are elderly, 65 and older. We've seen that in services specifically designed, knowing ahead of time this is an elderly community and designing the service to serve that community. We've also seen it in areas where the service wasn't specifically aligned around being an elderly community. Uh, for example, with city of Huntington Beach, around 50 to 60% of the riders using the service are 65 and older. In Lamert Park in South LA, uh, over 50% of those using the service are 65 and older. Um, so we've seen that with this service model and the different features that we have We've seen it align with how seniors like to travel and for local trips. Many of them use it to get to food, like a grocery store or a local restaurant. They use it to get to healthcare, and they use it to get to government services and other services like banks. Um, we also see that seniors use it for a lot of different types of trips that they couldn't use a bus or rail to access, and they might otherwise uh, walk. And you might say, replacing a walking trip is not our goal, but if you're having a senior in an area that doesn't have as great sidewalks, that they their only option is to walk, they might do that less frequently, and they might have other issues with public health, such as air quality of the air they're breathing in, the heat, and it might affect whether or not they're able to go to the grocery store, go to the bank, uh, or do this as, as frequently as they might want to. So there is some induced rides that happen, but it's from those that would have demand but not means to do them. Um, another example I would say that we've seen uh, with our Lamert Park project is uh, we kind of bridge gaps between where there's a expo line service and there's bus routes. And we know that in Los Angeles there's a lot of east and west service and there's not as much north and west connect, uh, north and south connections, sorry. Um, so we've seen riders use our service in Lamert Park to get to the expo line get off in Santa Monica and then use our service in Santa Monica to get to work. And this is, we, we didn't align the service around commutes, but some of these uh, workers may be using mid midday as their commute, not nine to five, for example. Uh, we've also seen riders use it, uh, bus stops are, are common uh, places that, that people request to go. They use our service to get to the Slauson uh, longer distance bus routes they get off in Marina del Rey and they use their service there. So we've seen them bridge um, our services with multiple transit trips. Uh, when we surveyed riders in San Diego, about a third of trips were connecting to transit. But when I talk to drivers, which I, I commonly do, because that's where I get a lot of the stories and context around these numbers that I see in the impact metrics, there's a lot more riders that use the service to connect to light rail when there's a baseball game in San Diego, for example, because they would prefer to use the light rail and a circuit than to drive themselves and deal with parking. So there's different use cases around why someone might use it and for different trips, and just asking a blanket question of, 
what do you primarily use? When we look at mode shift, how can we get more different types of trips shifted over sus to sustainable trips? And it's not just about the commute. We do see commute trips in some areas, but a lot of our trips are stringing a lot of local trips together. So by focusing on the hyper-local, it allows us to connect to transit when that's where people need to go, longer distances, but also connecting to them, them to their community and allowing to them engage further in the community. Yeah, I think uh, I like the example that Anne shared since I've actually lived it as an Uber driver. I've literally picked someone up at 1 or 2 a.m. in Los Angeles who was waiting for a bus that never came or maybe took too long. And uh, so I think those are clearly the trips where, you know, Ride Hill uh, can provide some value. I think uh, that they're, you know, identifying those types of opportunities are very important. And then at the same time, though, like I'm pretty skeptical that Ride Hill works well first, last mile connecting to transit. I mean, you know, kind of understanding the time when transit is busy, you know, same time everyone else wants to go out, mornings after, you know, rush hour in the mornings, rush hour in the afternoons. Those are the times when, you know, demand is also high on rideshare, right? So prices are going to be expensive, right? So that first last mile is connect connection, right? Getting dropped off downtown, if you take the expo line downtown at 5 p.m. and then try to call an Uber there, it's kind of a nightmare. There's nowhere to pick up and drop off. It's expensive <laughs> and it's a pretty crappy experience for everyone, you know, including the driver who has to sit there waiting, right? Drivers are not paid to wait, right? Which is all why they're always bugging you to get in the car quickly. <laughs> they want you in the car going 40, 50 miles an hour down the street. That's when they're kind of at optimal earnings. And so I think that, you know, it's tough sometimes because on a presentation or on a PowerPoint, you know, when you're talking about something, it sounds great, right? Like, hey, you know, we can take an Uber and, you know, we can hop on to transit and then we'll we arrive at our destination and call another Uber. But I think in the real world, it really hasn't played out that well. I do think that there are some interesting opportunities, you know, to identify that really come where, you know, obviously maybe transit isn't working so well or it's, you know, more expensive because they don't have the density that's required. You know, the thoroughfare isn't high late 1, 2, 3 a.m. at night. So I do think it's important, you know, to kind of identify those opportunities where it makes sense. I think in first last mile we have seen, you know, for maybe longer commuter rail type situations that where it, that's where it may be helpful, right? So maybe in less, uh, you know, lo times of lower demand, right, getting people to and from transit, getting new riders. I like the example that Alyssa shared with, you know, when you're going to like a, you know, I used to live in San Diego. Diego. So when you're going to, you know, you take the trolley downtown, for example, like that's like the perfect marketing opportunity to me, you know, where it's like, hey, normally these riders might not take it. But right now I want to go drink. It's more convenient. I can get there faster. I can get there cheaper. I have priority, you know, maybe not parking, but I have priority drop off, right? If the trolley drops me off right in front of the stadium versus, you know, one of the top complaints about SoFi Stadium here in LA is that there's a ton of traffic getting in and out there, you know, if you're in a car, right? So if there's sort of a, a fast lane or a fast pass, right? I think those are the types of opportunities where I think are uh, a lot more uh, synergistic. Any follow-ups? Oh, um, I would li like to also add that it's not just transit agencies that deal with these transit connections. We do have a program with Brightline, which is a high-speed rail in Florida, and they're interested in bridging this first last mile gap, both for ease of use of the Brightline service, but also part of their relaunch of the pandemic. They've combined technologies in micro-mobility and micro-transit to bridge the first and last mile with different options at di different uh, ranges um, outside of the station. So they have the bikes, uh, micro-mobility portion of it. We have neighborhood electric vehicles for short distances, electric sedans for longer distances, and the electric vans for uh, even further distances away from the station. So it it allows, uh, when it's designed around these type of programs, it's not designed to be disruptive or designed to take away. It can really be synergistic with a lot of these things that transit providers, whether they're public or private, mass transit, um, it can be a nice piece of that fabric. Okay, great. All right, so now let's get to one that's probably a little bit more polarizing. Um, so, labor. Uh, so the, the, let me uh, sort of preface this or, or set it up a little bit, that uh, Uber drivers and, and Lyft drivers are, uh, and they, these are this is the, the bulk of rideshare drivers, you know, many other companies are much smaller. They are for now in California, pending various court decisions, independent contractors. Um, and that has been uh, a source of great uh, controversy. Um, and I think to, to frame it a bit, the controversy sort of boils down to um, two questions, or I'll, I'll frame it as two questions, and then if I'm wrong, you guys can tell me. Um, one would be, 
whether that's substantially different than a lot of other jobs that are out there right now that prior to Uber and Lyft coming into this being, we didn't pay much attention to, with taxi drivers being an obvious uh, example. And the second being, um, what do the drivers want, right? Do the drivers want to be independent contractors or are they uh, wishing to be sort of full-time uh, employees with benefits and so forth? Uh, and because and, that seems to be where these lines get drawn, right? But uh, but it is in California, especially this is a, a source of great uh, controversy. Like where, where, what do we know about this dispute um, from the driver's side, from the from the labor side, uh, and and where do we think it's going? Sure. So I think the first concept that you have to understand, you know, really when it comes to labor and the gig economy is that there's a lot of variability, right? Um, there was a study that came out using Uber's actual earnings data in the city of Seattle by a Cornell researcher. And, you know, basically it was actually kind of controversial. But one of the things that wasn't so controversial when you looked at the numbers was actually the bottom 10% of earnings, uh, bottom 10% of earners in Seattle were earning about $5 an hour or less. And the top earners, the top 10% in Seattle were earning $40 an hour or more. Right, so you've got a pretty wide standard deviation there, and what that tells you, you know, I like citing that example. It's because depending on the car that you get into in the city of Seattle or the city of LA, this driver could hate the job or this driver could really love the job, right? And so I think when you kind of understand that about this nature of work, it starts to help you form, you know, your understanding and your decisions that there is a lot of variability when it comes to earnings, experience, flexibility, and you know, as far as what drivers want, think about the nature of the job. Like I just talked about how easy it is to get signed up. Up. I mean, you can literally, I signed up to drive from Uber for Uber from my couch. <laughs> I did a virtual, you can do a virtual inspection of your vehicle. Um, you can apply for everything online. You never need to see anyone. They don't even want to interview you, right? Uh, so getting into their funnel is very easy. And so once you've got, you know, because of all that variability, right, you've got a lot of different folks, right, that come in and because it's so easy to get in, it's also easy to leave, right? So you've got a lot of people coming in, you've got a lot of people coming out. And so I think that, uh, you know, when it comes to what drivers want, when it comes to this, right, it's a very uh, transitory job in general, right? So you, you know, I think there have been a number of surveys. I don't think it's, I think it's actually pretty well agreed upon now that, you know, because most drivers are doing 10 to 20 hours a week or less, most of those drivers do value the flexibility, right? The 10 to 20% of drivers who are doing 40 hours a week or more and kind of working like employees, but without any of the benefits, they're the ones who typically, you know, have more of a share of them want to be employees. But even then, you know, we've done a lot of survey data around this. And even then, the ones who are 40 hours a week or more, you see a higher percentage of them want to be employees and independent contractors. But there's still, you know, a pretty decent chunk that want to stay independent. And, you know, I think uh, on the last panel, it was interesting to hear about that bus driver, uh, about the bus drivers. And, you know, sort of, I think they mentioned it's hard to give them flexibility. But, you know, what we found is actually... a a lot of drivers, if you're working 40, 50 hours a week, you don't have a ton of flexibility. You kind of have to work the busiest times, you have to work the busiest places, but you're still in control, right? It's almost like you have to work Friday, Saturday night, you have to work Monday through Friday, rush hour. Um, but if you only want to, let's say, you know, we have a lot of older drivers that don't like driving at night. If you only want to drive days, it's like, okay, I know I'm going to work Monday through Friday, all the rush hours and put in my 40 hours a week then. So it's like you don't have complete flexibility, but you do have some control even though you're sort of still setting a schedule every week. It's just not someone else telling you what that schedule is. And I think that's the big uh, caveat. Yeah, I think from our side, uh, Circuit uh, hires all of their drivers. They're called driver ambassadors. We view them as ambassadors of the community. We have local hiring preferences to make sure that they know the community, they can drive around the community, but also that the community will receive them as part of the community. So it's a little different with our model. We have seen some former Uber and Lyft drivers be interested in driving with us because it's an employed position, but it's also fun, um, which sounds odd, uh, but uh, with our riders, a lot of the feedback they give us is the, the biggest reasons they like our service. It's affordable, many areas it's free, so that's the top reason. Um, the other reason uh, is either the drivers, it's fun, and it's electric. So these are, depending on the area, the top three reasons. But the drivers is one of the top reasons people love our service. And this could be 
uh, you know, a retired bus operator who decides he, they don't want to work full time, but they want to work some hours and they can ride with us. It's their community that they're familiar with. They are comfortable driving, or it could be an Uber and Lyft driver that wants something more stable. It could be someone from the community that just wants their start in some sort of career or job. And we've had some drivers who have moved up to other stages within our company as maintenance or one that became our accountant. Um, so there is some mobility within us, but there's also autonomy. We have, um, we're small enough, as in under 500 operators, but we're small enough that we have a very good connection with all of our drivers. And all of our corporate officers need to also have experience driving a, a service so that there is you know, good alignment. Who is, someone who is designing a service should also know the labor side. So we're not, not designing services that only operate two hours in the middle, in the beginning of the day and two hours at the end because they understand staffing that would be difficult and it would not align with how drivers like to, um, like to operate. And I'll just close with kind of a little anecdote. We also do a lot of community services in the areas that we operate. And we recently did one where there were um, a community block group that wanted to pass out uh, health packages for COVID within the community. One of the drivers who's from the community that, um, you know, is one of our best drivers, we gave them that task of working with that community block group. And afterwards, she told me, uh, she thanked me for being able to do that because it was something for her community and she felt the impact of what she was doing. So I think that very human side of the driver and the human side of the rider are both things to understand. Um, I understand myself that at scale, this is harder to do. When you're when you have 3,000 bus operators, it might be hard to get all of those different stories, but the, the operators are the really, really the ones that understand the rider and also understand these nice human elements and stories that give life to your data. And as someone who's, my, my research does not focus on labor, but I'll, I'll float out to questions for you all, things that, when I do think about the labor side, two things that I often think about are, one, what would this conversation look like um, if we thought about the broader ways our economies are ch are, is changing, things about the gig economy more broadly, things about, well, what about universal health care, right? How would this conversation be different if we kind of address the broader issue beyond uh, ride hail drivers? Um, and the um, other one is kind of to Mike's original framing question is, what does the labor issue look like in the long term, right? The ultimate goal of Uber and Lyft, so they say, is to become fully autonomous. Um, and so is this, you know, a short term? I, I don't think they're moving there anytime soon. Um, but it's, it's certainly an interesting thing about thinking about where did they see this going? Um, and what role does labor have in, in the interim? Uh, um, yeah. And I think I was talking with Harry um, earlier about how when we, we look at micromobility, there is kind of this ability to be a fleet manager. So you can be an independent contractor that manages other independent contractors. And I haven't seen that as much in the independent contractor model of rideshare, but that would be an interesting component where you can allow community members to uh, scale up and build a business rather than just being an independent operator. Yeah, I mean, I think definitely, you know, one, I guess one of the, the positives, right? I mean, uh, if you're driving for Uber in LA, you are part of that local community. You might get 70% of every fare, and that's one of the things drivers complain about, that Uber and Lyft take too much. But, you know, a majority of every single ride is going back into the pocket of someone that's operating there. But I think they exist in this weird gray area where they're an independent contractor, and technically they are a business owner. They do need a 1099. They do need to file a Schedule C. They have all of the same uh, liabilities and requirements and insurance that, you know, multi-million dollar business might have, but they're basically just working for Uber, or basically just working for Uber and Lyft. And so I do think there's interesting, you know, this concept of the owner operator, right, which some companies like Bird, for example, here in LA, they've got fleet managers now. It used to be independent contractors like me. I used to pick up and charge scooters, and then they moved to a fleet manager model where you're still not quite your own business, but you work a little closer with Bird, and you're responsible for a lot more in inventory and things like that. So I think definitely on the labor side, I mean, there, there's a lot of different models out there and you know there are companies operating where you can be an employee but I guess for me I think that there's a lot of opportunity in the existing space 
to help everyone with the things that they care about, right? If you go and, you know, we mentioned healthcare, right? Um, a lot of drivers actually already have some form of healthcare, right? So they've got a spouse, they've got another job, they've got a side gig, um, but about 10 to 15% of Uber and Lyft drivers don't have healthcare. And so for them, it's a pretty huge issue, right? To not have healthcare, but for the rest of the 85% that might have to, you know, give up something so that that 15% gets healthcare, it's, you know, not the best thing, and you know, they, they might prefer not, right? So I think that there are enough things, though, that all drivers care about, you know, whether it's earning more. You know, I've really been highlighting uh, the city of Seattle recently. We had a couple folks from their office on the podcast, on my podcast, and we've done a couple interesting uh, sort of pieces around what they're doing because they've kept this independent contractor model of Seattle and I think it just got signed by the governor. Uh, the bill was expanded to cover the entire state of Washington, but it really uh, keeps drivers as independent contractors, but actually gives them a slew of really never before seen benefits. So they have a true minimum wage that's pretty high compared to California, which is more of a guaranteed earnings. You're, it's not a true minimum wage since it doesn't count the time when you're not with a rider. They've got a third party deactivation center. So right now in the state of California, if I'm deactivated by Uber and Lyft, I might just not be able to log on one day. They'll never never tell me what happened, never tell me why. And it's a pretty crappy feeling if you're someone who's done 25,000 trips for the company and you know have a 4.9 star rating like one of our contributors, Jay, who this exact situation happened to. And it turned out it was a DMV background check error. And uh, that can't really happen in the city of Seattle anymore. And they've got sick pay and some cool things that you know really kind of, to me, like what all drivers care about. They care about this earnings floor, right? They care about making more. They care about not being unfairly deactivated versus if you start looking at some of these things that you know are really important to 10 or 15 percent of people it's going to be a lot more polarizing all right okay so uh, before we turn this over to the slido questions i'm just going to go to one last question uh, away from labor and back to transportation planning um, so uber does uber and lyft do not position themselves as transportation companies but they are very much a part of the transportation system and regulated as such. And one thing we've seen, uh, particularly as they became larger, is they are getting sort of blamed for some transportation problems like traffic congestion and sometimes uh, taxed to account for those problems, right? This was usually city by city, occasionally state by state. Um, but so what do we, you know, what do we make of this? The, the, is this just a, a sort of a cynical example of everybody realizing that, you know, nobody likes tech companies and if we have to raise some revenue, we should blame them for something or tax them? Or are there some real impacts here that um, it's appropriate to hold them accountable for? Most notably, the one you hear the most about is, is traffic congestion. Is Uber, is it congesting our cities? Will it continue to? I'm going to start with Anne. Great. I have a lot of thoughts about this. Um, <laughs> I had this question a couple years ago going, it seems like some cities and states are starting to tax Uber and Lyft, but what does that actually look like? Right, and I'll also caveat all this with saying some states um, preempt what cities can do about ride hailing and, and regulating or taxing, right? So in some cases, cities themselves can't tax. But those that do, I conducted basically a, a survey digging around state budgets and uh, different uh, documents looking at, well, what are, what are they actually taxing? So um, there's different cities, counties, states that do tax ride hail, it varies enormously, both in the amount and then how they do it. So some have a flat uh, tax per ride, some do it per mile, some do differentiate based on pooled or not pooled services. It varies enormously. And the other thing it varies enormously on is what that tax revenue then funds. So Philadelphia, for example, funds public schools. Um, others fund the, just the general fund with no other um, detail other than, than that. Some fund a local transit agency. So it varies enormously. Looking into a specific city, so I looked at, for example, the city of Chicago publishes all their ride hail data, so you can look at millions of trips. Um, and both how a tax is structured matters and where, it, where the revenues go really matter. When we're thinking about the impacts that these, these could have, especially the equity in, impact. So when you look at um, individual level equity, if you have a, a fee that's flat, it's going to disproportionately fall on people who are taking trips in low income areas. They take shorter trips, they take cheaper trips, and they take more pooled trips um, in those areas. So um, flat fees are going to be more regressive. However, when you also look at Chicago, 75% of trips either begin or end in a high income area. And so when you think about this tax as potentially generating millions and millions of dollars, it really matters what you do with that. So if you are reinvesting those millions of dollars that are either beginning or ending in 
high income areas. And that's, you know, caveat here again, I don't know who's making those trips. It could be service workers, right? Ending or beginning in higher income areas. But if you're investing that into say transit or um, e-bikes for all or e-bikes for low income folks as we've heard floated around um, or other services, it could also be a redistribution of, of funds. But both the, the structure matters and especially where that money um, goes really matters, I think, as cities think about um, continuing to either tax or evolve their, their fees and taxation moving forward. Yeah, I mean, I think that's interesting. I mean, definitely, you know, one thing that you see as an Uber driver is they send out these, uh, qu they call them quest promotions every single week and they're trip-based incentives. And in the past, you know, they've had maps of basically where they want you to drive. And I remember we did this article once, sort of a <laughs> separate topic. I think the title of the article is, are rideshare drivers actually racist? But one of the, you know, reasons why we did that, we lined up sort of these maps of where Uber is telling drivers to drive, which is basically, hey, this is where the demand is. And just like Ann said, you know, I don't think it's exclusive to Chicago. It's pretty much every, major city where you know most of the rides are happening in the higher socioeconomic areas right they want you in LA you know they want drivers to be in West LA they want them to be in Hollywood downtown South Bay Venice Mar you know that those types of areas that's where the rides are happening you know also most drivers can't afford to live in those areas either right so they're driving in and out of those areas so I think it is important but I think when it comes to the fees you know kind of coming from the driver's perspective I think there's a lot of good causes that it can go to but you know I think Uber and Lyft are kind of easy scapegoats, right? I mean, I've lived, in, I grew up in LA and live here now and congestion and traffic has always been pretty bad. I mean, I think it is, uh, you know, probably a little bit worse because of Uber and Lyft, but is it the sole reason? Most definitely not. I think a lot of the studies say that Uber and Lyft is still in single digit percentages of total VMT. And so, you know, I think they're an easy scapegoat for a lot of existing issues and there are some negative externalities, but, you know, I think when it comes to, you know, charging them fees and taxes because of their negative externalities, it's important to sort of, you know, not you know, just charge them or tax them just for the heck of it, right? Actually reinvest those services and things that matter. And especially if you kind of want to sell it to the drivers, you know, sort of invest in services that matter. The city of Seattle added a per trip fee and then uh, they use that to fund the third party deactivation centers. So, you know, drivers aren't sitting there and doing the math like, oh, wow, there's a 50 cent, you know, fee on my trips now. And, um, you know, five cents of that goes to the deactivation center. They think, oh, there's a fee on all the trips and now we have a deactivation center. That sounds really cool. <laughs> you know, if I'm unfairly deactivated, I have this option. I have this avenue now. Uh, you know, another thing we see that drivers want, you know, especially during the pandemic is actually better access to bathrooms. This is especially, you know, for Uber and Lyft drivers, this has always been an issue, but especially for uh, food delivery and couriers, right? Typically in the past, they could actually, you know, now businesses are opening up, but during the pandemic, you know, they literally wouldn't let you into the restaurant. There was nowhere to really use the restroom, right? And that's a potential service that, you know, we've heard floated that, you know, maybe cities could provide. So I think that's kind of, to me, I'm okay with fees just as long as they're kind of, you know, basically sold, you know, as long as they're kind of understanding where this money is going to, and it's not just to tax them, to tax them, but, uh, you know, to push people over, you know, whether it's to push people over to, you know, more shared rides or to incentivize EV trips or to incentivize, you know, actual, you know, maybe charge Uber, for example, a little bit of a lower fee, you know, if trips start in lower socioeconomic areas, because then as a driver, you know, they'll adjust their, uh, you know, sort of uh, marketplace to sort of get more drivers into those areas potentially. Yeah, I think um, there's a lot of focus on these new fees that Uber and Lyft as uh, transportation technology companies that aren't subject to the other transportation regulation. So if you look at how a, a transportation agency might have to operate or one that subcontracts with the transportation agency or tax you or limousine, there's a lot of other fees and regulations that they have to follow just to be able to operate that sometimes Uber and Lyft, in, depending on the jurisdiction, don't have to deal with at all. And when you're looking at that, it doesn't look as different to have a fee on Uber and Lyft when they are not paying these other permits and fee costs. Um, for example, uh, with Circuit, whether or not we're doing a project with Department of Transportation uh, in LA or not, we all of our vehicles have to be inspected and we have to be permitted regularly, the drivers and the, uh, and the vehicles, that Uber and Lyft are not as subject to. So it, in California, it's at the state level. City by city, we can't um, charge Uber and Lyft or, or other new operators like uh, Alto or, or others. Uh, they're not subject to that same regulation that taxis and limousines and um, for hire vehicles 
bar charge when it's a small business. So I think that's a, a difference to consider here. Um, but I think it also matters where, where transit agencies are disp deciding to spend their money and when they are using a contracted service that it meets all of those requirements that they have to follow. If they're just using Uber and Lyft for that, they, Uber and Lyft would have to follow those same guidelines. Um, so, you know, if Uber and Lyft are not regularly doing these background checks that a, an independent fleet operator would have to manage, then it's not as fair. Um, so I, I think that's just a part of considering whether or not to have fees on Uber and Lyft is what do other comparable services also have to do? Yeah, I, I, I totally agree. And I mean, I think the, the only thing I'd sort of push back, not on you necessarily, but in general, when it comes to regulations, as long as they're good regulations, I'm okay with it, <laughs> right? I think there's a lot of archaic and old regulations that frankly don't make sense in the time of technology, right? If you just need to go in, you know, I mean, for example, we had one of our, actually my, our, our good contributor, Jay, back, in, <laughs> back into the narrative again. He tried out driving for a taxi flywheel in San Francisco, and there was a number of things that he had to do in the sign-up process that frankly just didn't make sense in the 21st century of, you know, like being able to you know, for example, do a simple uh, vehicle inspection, you know, to make sure the brakes and tires and things like that are working. You know, Uber and Lyft services on Uber and Lyft where you can do a lot of that virtually, and I've done it before. You set up your phone <laughs> against a rock and, uh, you know, they can do a lot of the basic checks. Obviously, for more in-depth checks, you might actually need to go to a smog site or uh, an actual center. So, I think it's sort of a good example of where, you know, a lot of these companies are definitely not perfect in any respect, but I do think it's important to kind of understand, like, what are the areas where they have, you know, a lot of times it's leveraged technology to make things easier, you know, to make drivers safer. You know, I have to do a selfie check every once in a while, you know, with my Uber phone to make sure that it's, I am actually the driver who I'm saying, right? It's not that big of a deal. I don't know how actually <laughs> accurate it is. And if that completely replaces, you know, verification of a driver, that probably wouldn't be a good thing. But just to periodically do it here and there to make sure that you actually are the driver who you know is supposed to be driving and do a quick verification and things like that. I think that makes a lot of sense. And I think there is a lot of that uh, technology that uh, exists out there where you can kind of really leverage you know the things that they do well. And you know if that's sort of the regulation. I mean, Uber just partnered with uh, taxis in New York City, and I think this makes a lot of sense. You know, taxis. I mean, there literally isn't an app that you can really call a taxi in reliably in every major city in the United States. And if they're part of the Uber network in the future, that's a good example, I think, of, you know, kind of leveraging them. Now Uber's going to have more supply, solve some of those, you know, pricing issues you talked about, Mike, right? If there's more supply and rides are now cheaper and taxis, which if you look at the numbers, again, all of the data is released for uh, TLC and taxi in New York City, and you can look at the fare box declining, and you can look at basically all the numbers for taxi are declining. And I imagine with a partnership like this with Uber, you know, they'll see a lot of those numbers uh, start to stable out or maybe even start going up. And I right. think, um, Mike, the last thing I'll just to like bring your original question and with what Harry, uh, Harry also said about thinking, just reinforcing the idea that you raised here about how important it is what those fees fund and making it meaningful. So the fee itself, the increment, the five cents, 10 cents a trip, 25 cents a trip, is unlikely to totally deter a trip, right? So if we're thinking about this as congestion mitigation, et cetera, that is not likely going to happen in both what Harry mentioned, the single digit contribution that Ride Hill has to VMT, but also the broader policy goal. So if our goal is congestion, mitigating congestion, uh, well, we can't build our way out of congestion. We all know that. Um, but if we're pricing it, ride hailing alone is not the answer, right? There's such a small fraction of the overall pool. I think it's just, again, to the, the points that raised earlier, they're essentially low-hanging fruit. They're not the public that the, the, vote, that the uh, public officials have to go answer to. And so it's a low-hanging fruit, but it's not the, the full fruit that we need to um, reach that solution. And I'll just quickly add that congestion pricing would be another way of having these fees that it's broader. That Congestion pricing also would affect ride hail, and whether or not that's Uber and Lyft paying it or the individual drivers is a different question. I agree. Okay. Um, thank you. And now we are going to throw open the gates of Slido. Um, so we'll turn it over, and the, the first question comes from our previous presenter from the morning, Deborah Salon. Come on up. Is this on? Yes. Um, so, yeah, as I wrote up there, I, I, Uber at some point, and maybe they still do, had a driver setting called destination mode, I believe, 
which allowed drivers to set a you know direction they were going, a destination they were heading toward, and then um, and then the the app would would match them with riders that were going generally in that direction. And I thought that would be a really, I always thought that'd be a really uh, promising, you know, option for drivers to use and and for both them and for congestion reduction and for making our roads more efficient and having and an argument that Uber could use to make ride hailing, you know, part of the sustainable transportation solution. And I've only ever heard about it once. So I wonder if you have any comments about that. <laughs> yeah, uh, well, so I talked about the, the number one most popular feature for drivers was instant pay. And the second most popular feature is probably destination filter, which as you alluded to, it's basically, that's what it does. It allows you to put a destination and now you can also put a time that you wanna arrive somewhere by and it'll give you rides only headed in that direction. That's what it's supposed to do. If you talk to some drivers, they'll say the algorithm doesn't work that well, but you know, for the most part, it kind of gets you only rides headed in that direction. And, you know, I mean, we typically see a lot of drivers use this at the beginning and the end of their shifts, right? Because most folks don't, can't afford to live in the areas where they drive. So if they live out east um, or, you know, out in the valley or south or whatever direction, but here, you know, where all the rides happen, they'll use that setting in the morning to try and find a ride in. And also at the end of the night when they want to get back, you you know, the matching, as you could imagine, right? Like you need kind of like high density of people going to the area that you're gonna go for it, the, the product to work really well. I haven't actually ever really seen it marketed in the way that you mentioned as kind of a, you know, congestion reducing tool or, you know, sort of a carpooling option. But I do think it's a great idea. I actually did an article a few years ago where uh, for, a f I think about a month, I only drove with the destination filter. So anywhere I wanted to go in the city of LA, I turned on the destination filter. And you actually, you know, you might only get one or two trips here and there, but if you calculate it on an hourly rate, you make, you know, I think the few years ago it was like thirty to forty dollars an hour, but it might be, you know, you went five minutes out of your way and you made four dollars, right? So um, it's a lot of small things, but I do think that could be interesting. I haven't really ever seen Uber market it like that, but I think that's a good example of leveraging, you know, those technological features. Uh, you know, most people, I've never actually heard anyone not in the industry ask, ask me about that, so you definitely know your stuff, but, <laughs> you know, most people may not even know about those types of features, but that's a perfect example of something that I think is, you know, really innovative and really cool and can be leveraged in a lot of different, uh, you know, opportunities. I, I don't know that Thank much you. about that specific one, but I have seen Waze try to do this with Waze Carpool um, as a way of, you know, leveraging their data to also reduce congestion, but I, I'm not sure how that has gone exactly, but... Um, I mean, I think the problem, you know, we've worked with a lot of carpooling apps, and I think that there's definitely some challenges on sort of logistically, right? Like if you have two unfixed endpoints, you really need kind of like high density and, you know, fixing one endpoint. There's a company called Scoot uh, that operated in the Bay Area that pre-pandemic did a lot of carpooling to big campuses like Google and, you know, Apple and Facebook. And so everyone was going to the same place in the morning and tended to live in the same five or six neighborhoods. What I really liked about that model, too, is that I believe you actually had to do one ride a month as a driver. So you couldn't just be a rider. And I think what that does, it, it kind of builds a lot of that empathy, right? The I've never been the biggest fan of services like Uber Pool and, you know, drivers hate Uber Pool. <laughs> I think passengers also hate Uber Pool and sharing rides, to be honest, too, in America. They just take it because it's cheaper. But, um, you know, when you're a driver and you've got someone, you know, or a passenger and you've got to wait two minutes for them to come outside or they're not ready when you get there, you know, it sort of starts to build empathy if you're on that other side. And then the next time you're a rider, you might think, oh, I don't want to keep my driver waiting. So there are some carpooling options like that, but, uh, you know, for various reasons, none have really uh, taken off here in the uh, United States. Yeah, uh, thanks. Um, I had a question back on the labor issue. This is uh, Jacob Wasserman at ITS again. Um, I was wondering about sort of the framing of a dichotomy between flexibility and employment W-2 status, and I, I, I don't really see that as a dichotomy. There are plenty of W-2 workers, full time or full employees who aren't full time; they're part time. They even have flexible hours under W-2 status. And uh, prior to Prop 22 in California, the ABC test was an independent contractor is just what you think they are under common sense. They work in a separate industry for multiple clients, which I don't really think describes Uber and Lyft drivers. Um, but but to get back to the point, I guess. Have you done surveys of drivers where you ask not about employment status, but what, you know, what benefits they actually want, and then see how that might map onto um, employment yeah. status? 
You know, it's funny that you asked that because I feel like we have looked at that before and sort of asked drivers what they wanted. And what you, when you start asking drivers about what they want, a lot of what they want kind of lines up pretty well with being an employee. <laughs> you know, they're like, we want higher pay. We don't want to be fired, you know, without a judge and a jury, right? And so a lot of things that they actually want. So I think a lot of times what I've found is actually like perception is often more important than reality, right? Like if drivers think they're making a lot of money, you know, as long as it's when, within reason of what they're making, like that's what they care about, right? Um, Uber just released this surcharge of 50 cents per trip and it's like doesn't seem like a lot if you do the math though and you've got a Prius or something like that you're actually making more now than you were before right with a 50 cent per trip surcharge uh, but it just doesn't seem like a lot on the surface right it's like it's only 50 cents I just paid seven dollars for, for gas like there's some sort of mismatch there and so I think that um, you know kind of the sorry what was the original part of the question it was uh, just on the, the dichotomy or supposed dichotomy between flexibility and uh, yeah I mean so I think this is one thing that I feel pretty strongly you know I, I've gotten pushback um, from, you know, folks on the labor side that say, you know, there's nothing on in the law, right, that says employees lose flexibility or are less flexible. But I do think in reality, right, if you look at just how flexible driving for Uber and Lyft is, you can literally log on whenever and wherever you want. There's no arguing that it's not, you know, it is more flexible than being an employee as an independent contractor. But most drivers don't actually use all of the flexibility, right? And that's what I think is interesting. So like New York City is a good example. They instituted an actual minimum minimum wage and now as an as a, you know so once they move to that right which, which is one component of being an employee and now as a driver an Uber and Lyft driver in New York City you can't log on whenever and wherever you want right because if you log on on a Tuesday in the outer boroughs the companies have to pay you for that time and so that wasn't the smartest driving move before they instituted this system but you did lose some flexibility right so it's sort of like they're now kind of like coaching you in you know forcing you however you want to term it right into better driving I mean this is kind of what my whole business is about. It's like telling drivers when and where to drive to make the most amount of money. Um, but I think that what's really interesting is that you know, when drivers have that semblance of control, that's kind of what makes the difference. Like they, like I talked about with the full-time drivers earlier, they're gonna work 40 hours a week, but if they've got, you know, the ability to once in a while, you know, not do the shift and not have a big punishment, I think that's kind of like the flexibility, you know, in a lot of surveys, right, that we've done, say drivers, they care about the pay and the flexibility, right? And so I think that it's really more important to get that perception of flexibility than the actual, you know, flexible nature, because you are right. I mean, and I think companies like probably Circuit and Alto and others that are hiring drivers as employees, I think they're doing a good job of taking the best of driving for Uber and Lyft. That's sort of, you know, hey, we're going to reward our top drivers and give them first crack at a shift and they can book it all online and they can cancel, you know, occasionally, right? You can't cancel every trip as an Uber driver, as an independent contractor, right? But it's a lot tougher, you know, in more traditional uh, staffing employment. Yeah, Thanks. and I could talk about um, our drivers and we have done employee surveys um, we did um, one through, I forget what the tool is called, I think it was Culture Amp, and we got an 89% satisfaction rate of employees across the board that were uh, satisfied with both Circuit's work culture and their agency within the company. Um, also, we have a great retention rate among drivers. Uh, drivers generally enjoy uh, working with us. And some of those different features that I've seen them like is uh, you know, some of the ability to work uh, cultural and local events within their community. Um, some of it is the, the flexibility of if they're hired to work within Lamert Park, for example, they could also pick up shifts as they want in Santa Monica, Marina del Rey, or other like locations. And there is also the opportunity of being able to move up, but I think it's really the agency. For example, a small piece of what we do, we don't tell the drivers exactly the path that they have to drive to pick up the rider because uh, depending on construction, which Google Maps might not tell you about, or whether or not a road is closed for, uh, uh, you know, by police or by public service or, or for other reasons, prescribing the route might not be the best way to get an efficient trip or efficient pickup. So these small little ways to give drivers agency in how they're performing uh, their service and then also giving feedback and coaching for, you know, we understand if there was a low rating on one situation, we, we can get more context around it and be able to reward drivers for doing well, but also being able to coach them up. I think they like to see their ratings to see how they're doing and to be able to perform well against their employees. So it's somewhat motivation that way, but they, it, it really helps to 
expand our culture, not just in our corporate part, but throughout the drivers, that it's really this fun uh, experience where they, their voice is heard. Yeah, I, I think the upward mobility, I like that term, it's key, right? Because that's something that you really don't get on Uber and Lyft and working in the gig economy. And so I think it's really important to kind of, you know, like I said, across the tech and here and when it comes to labor, like there's a lot of things that Uber and Lyft and, you know, new tech companies do well. So copy that, <laughs> steal that, um, you know, and do more of that. I mean, it's funny, like I've never worked with Uber and Lyft on, you know, stuff like this. I would say like probably a lot of the time I spend those with other companies or competitors. It's like, hey, what do Uber and Lyft do well? Let's take some of that. But what don't they do well, right? Like there's no opportunity for upward mobility. How do we kind of tease that out? How do we find those people? What about the people who don't like using their own vehicle? Okay, that's a marketing angle. Like, hey, come use, drive our car. Don't put, you know, 1,500 miles on your car so that you don't have to go to the shop and, you know, get an oil change and new brakes every month or two, so. Thanks both. Um, Jody, uh, your question is up next. Hi, everyone. I'm Jody Litvak. Um, for those of you who've been regulars up the mountain in Arrowhead, I think I asked this question some years ago when we had the um, conference focused on um, technology, but it's becoming more and more perhaps possible, although it may seem a long way off. I want to know when the day is going to come when I can pay one monthly fee, have one single app on my phone, and I can use it for everything. I can take transit, I can get a car share, I can get a ride share, I can get a bike, I can get a scooter. Um, I, I want that, I want it now. <laughs> By the way, this is a question for everybody. <laughs> <laughs> so everybody just uh, chime in. But no, I mean, I think to be honest, right, I think this is actually, this might be a good future topic because I think it's, again, right, I think it's an area where, you know, private companies are going to have very different incentives than, you know, the average citizen and governments and regulators. But I can definitely tell you, I mean, it's something that, you know, Uber probably want, would love to be that, you know, all-encompassing app. And I think it's a direction that they're moving and something to kind of keep an eye on. I mean, you know, you've got uh, obviously rides, you've got food. This is one thing where I think Uber has a huge advantage because they have this multitude of different services. A lot of the companies are integrating transit, you know, integrating micromobility. You know, obviously Uber and Lyft have their own micromobility outfits. Lyft just partnered with Spin, for example, to offer scooters and e-bikes in the cities where they don't have micromobility options. So I think they definitely love the idea of a super app. And these companies are all big on frequency, right? They want the services, you know, rides and food are kind of the, ser the two services where you're going to order a lot of high quantity, high volume, volume, right? And so I think those are kind of the cornerstones to any app, right? I'm not going to download some app to, you know, rent a car once a month if I don't have a car, but I am going to download an app if I need to take one ride a week or order, you know, like in my case with two kids, like one meal every single, <laughs> every single night. Um, so I think that's kind of the thing that it's good and bad. And I guess to answer your question directly, I mean, I think that, you know, for honestly, I've given, you know, even since eight years ago, you know, driving around in LA, I've met people, lots of people who actually don't own a car in the city of LA and, you know, they take Ubers and, you know, and then once scooters popped up, they started taking scooters and then they rented cars. And so I think that, you know, you can kind of already do it. <laughs> and maybe public transit. Uh, maybe. <laughs> it's like class pass for mobility. Uh. I think there's there's one aspect of how Circuit operates that it's a little different for Uber and Lyft, and that you can actually request a ride from the street. And I think that what that does is it gives, like a, a bus might do, it gives access to people who don't have smartphones and don't have bank accounts and other sorts of things. So I think as long as that sort of solution blends well with how people who don't have smartphones and don't have bank accounts and um, for for them to be able to access the services too. So I would look at that like, how are we gonna build transit hubs to be able to do that as well, where if my phone dies, I'm not like having a, a security anxiety attack of like, oh my gosh, I can't get anywhere now. So I think it's how do we not just put it on a phone, but how do we integrate it across a system that you don't actually have to have a phone to do it? Well, I, th I think that's a good point because, I mean, that's not how Uber works, right? You do need a phone, right? So, I mean, that's like an important consideration. There are going to be people left out, right, that with this model, if you, that's sort of why I said it's something to keep an eye on. They're not going to be building their product anytime, any soon for someone without a phone, right? And they might talk about it and they might say it, but they've got a mass market product, right? And think about who their consumers they're going after. And mentioned 75% of trips in higher socioeconomic areas, right? So understanding who is their customer, that's their private company, that's who they're going to build to. 
too. So I think the incentives are definitely uh, different there. But at the same time, you know, still, you know, not necessarily a bad thing, but uh, you know, depending on how you look at it, right? Well, and the only thing I'll add on to that is, Jody, it's a good question about when. Um, I have no idea. Um, but cities are certainly experimenting with this, right? So mobility wallets, for example, where you can not only hail, you can compare different modes across an app, um, hail or ride transit, ride, get a scooter, et cetera, and pay for it all in one place. Um, I think Alyssa's point about the, you know, the about who owns smartphones, who doesn't, I think is a really, really important point. Increasingly, we're seeing greater smartphone adoption across income levels, across race, race ethnicities. One thing we're not seeing is necessarily access to data. So any kind of platform that is developed for this, let's say people have a smartphone, what kind of data does this take? So an Uber or Lyft, right, you watch the car come to you. That's really satisfying, but it's also really data intensive. So how can we also ensure that um, not only if people have a smartphone in their pocket, that they have sufficient data to still hail these services? All right, great. All right, I uh, feel comfortable that we have settled all these issues now. <laughs> and so uh, nobody go anywhere because the very last event, there's no break. We're just going to hear from Juan. But before we do that, please join me in thanking our panel.